Hello and welcome back to my channel. In this episode, we'll visit a few lodging options around Yellowstone Lake before heading north into the hot mud volcano area under the scorching middle day sun. Lake Yellowstone Hotel is one of the oldest lodges in the park. You won't miss its bright yellow color when you drive around the lake on the Grand Loop Road. Park at the back of the hotel, right next to the USPS office. Immediately inside, you will see the reception and lounge area. The 100-year-old grand piano is on display here. Piano and string quartet performances happen during dinner time. Of course, this is a premium location to enjoy the lake view. Imagine having a cup of morning joe here watching the sunrise over the lake. Notice the old-fashioned heating unit under the window, reminding you of the 150-year history of the property. One thing that you might not know, until 2016, the property offered only communal showers, which means after your dinner and the grand piano performance, you could see more of the well-dressed guest at the next table later that night in the communal shower. See a lot more of him or her. Looking out onto Yellowstone Lake, it may look very peaceful to you. Blue sky with no clouds. An excellent day to kayak. I thought to myself, then I remembered a story that I read in a book called Death in Yellowstone by Lee Whittlesey. Here is a quote from chapter six concerning freak lightning fatalities in Yellowstone. And here I quote, in 1885, Arnold Haig's US Geological Survey parties were exploring Yellowstone Park. On Sunday morning, September 5th, one party under topographer John H. Renshaw put out into Yellowstone Lake in an old sailboat that they had found. The party of four set sail for Mary Bay from the Yellowstone River outlet on this unusually warm day. Renshaw sat in the bow managing the sail. M.D. Scott took the seat near the mast to handle the oars, and the other two men sat in the stern. The sun was out and no threatening clouds were present although the day was somewhat sultry. The men were about 100 yards from the shore. Suddenly, the men back on the beach heard a crashing thunderclap that stampeded their horses. The four men on the lake were rendered unconscious by a bolt of lightning that knocked down the mast of their boat. Renshaw gradually awoke in a dazed condition to find that neither of his legs worked nor did his right arm. On his wrist was a severe burn. Looking around, Renshaw saw that Scott was bent over his knees, dead. The bolt from the blue had struck him in the head, causing a large burn mark. A long, dark streak ran the entire length of Scott's body, showing where the lightning had run, and a hole in the bottom of the boat showed where it had exited the craft. Fortunately, the boat was close to shore and drifted in. The third man was relatively unharmed, but the fourth was out of his head all night. Renshaw gradually recovered the use of his legs, but his arm remained paralyzed for two weeks, and the burn on his wrist left a lifetime scar." End quote. So maybe kayaking would still be fun, but I won't sail a sailboat on Yellowstone Lake after hearing that story. Next door to the Lake Yellowstone Hotel is Lake Lodge Cabin. It is known for having the best gift shop among all the lodging options in the park. So stop by and check out the souvenirs. And of course, 
the row of rocking chairs on the front porch with another cup of coffee and a croissant. Next up, we stopped at the Landmark Fishing Bridge, where Lake Yellowstone flows into the Yellowstone River. The lake bridge is right next to the famous Fishing Bridge RV Park. If you've stayed at this park before, please leave a comment below to tell us how it was. How was your experience with RVing in Yellowstone? Despite the name Fishing Bridge, the sign at the bridge told us that the Yellowstone River is permanently closed to fishing from one mile downstream of the Fishing Bridge to a quarter mile upstream. In the past, native cutthroat trout spawned here, and it was a popular fishing spot. You can see the water flow is slow and low. Slow water encourages the growth of aquatic grass and other vegetation. According to NorthForkAnglers.com, the flow on September 4 is only 1,370 cubic feet per second at this lake outlet. Suppose you remember what we talked about in the previous episode. The native Yellowstone cutthroat trout occur naturally nowhere else on Earth except in the Yellowstone ecosystem. They eat water insects or even small mammals when they grow large enough. However, it is only about one-third the size of common lake trout, which makes them easy prey of lake trout. Lake trout, on the other hand, were illegally introduced into the Yellowstone ecosystem in 1880, when the Army was managing the Yellowstone Park system. Together, four trout species were widely introduced, brook, brown, lake, and rainbow. Rainbow trout hybridize with native cutthroat trout, thus diluting genetic diversity. They caused the depletion of the native Yellowstone cutthroat trout. To avoid a similar mistake, the park forbids using live bait in Yellowstone National Park. It is illegal to transport fish among any waters in the Yellowstone region. This is a pullout around the Lahardy Rapids. I lost my footing here and fell. The branches of a dead tree scratched my thigh and it took two weeks to heal. And now we are at one of the major attractions of Yellowstone's Southern Loop, the Mud Volcano. The whole scene looks and smells like an ancient battlefield. From what I read on the National Park Service website, one of the most acidic features in the park, Sulphur Cauldron, is located here. Remember the first mud pot we saw at the West Thumb parking lot. The acidity plays a part in making the mud pot different from most hot springs and geysers. Hydrogen sulfide gas is present deep in the earth. Some microorganisms use this gas as an energy source. They help convert the gas to sulfuric acid, which breaks down rocks to clay. In other words, mud. Hydrogen sulfide, steam, carbon dioxide, and other gases are busy acting and reacting to each other, creating all the bubbles and explosion that we see and the uplifting and sinking of the ground that's not quite visible to us when we just pass by on the boardwalks. The hydrogen sulfide gas gives out the pungent odor of rotten eggs.
Here on the ground, it is sulfur minerals working again, painting the fit features in hues of yellow and shades of gray. Here is a quote from the National Park Service Mud Volcano Trail Guide. Quote, sour Lake, named for its acidic or sour water, may look like a pleasant swimming hole, but its water would burn your skin like battery acid. Most of its acid comes from microorganisms that create sulfuric acid as they consume sulfur. These microorganisms also give the lake its color. This lake is the most prominent acid pool in the mud volcano area. Most of the attraction site of Yellowstone has boardwalks that run in loops. In the case of a mud volcano, there are two loops. The small one on the north loop is short, but has the most famous dragon mouth spring. So if you are tired, you can choose to only walk through the short loop instead of the big loop and get the highlight of the trip. This is indeed a very well planned national park. Here we are, finishing up the more giant southern loop. We'll start at the Dragon Mouth Spring in the next episode. Thanks for watching.